over 450 people who registered, but currently we have 39, 37 of us here. Um, so Irina is going to take us through the, um, the presentation. Irina is the Open Access Program Manager from IFO, and he's been having this with us since July. And as I said, um, so we are going to, he's going to take us through all. So ladies and gentlemen, I just want to welcome you and stay cool and enjoy the presentation. Irina, over the floor. The floor is yours, please. Thank you. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Always happy to do this webinars and discussions with uh, colleague uh, members and, and partners. Thanks a lot for joining us this morning. Uh, as you see, it's a very broad topic. Uh, so what I'll try to do, I'll try to highlight uh, some of uh, the most uh, important areas. Uh, I'll also provide links to shorter materials where you can read more on uh, each topic that uh, I would cover, because I think we could spend a month just discussing this um, uh, topic. Uh, and we would very much like to work with you if you want to explore some of the new approaches or tools that uh, I will mention now. So that I hope uh, just the beginning of our conversation. And um, I'll start with uh, a resource for librarians uh, that we released recently and uh, created together with uh, uh, University of Dublin College Library, especially Julia Barrett. Uh, and um, we call it uh, Digital Research Literacy Training Program Outline for Librarians. And uh, it includes uh, topics uh, that uh, could be included uh, in trainings for librarians uh, and also training for researchers on uh, different areas and uh, useful reading materials. And uh, of course, uh, one of the topics is about uh, measuring impact. Uh, and uh, we have uh, two parts uh, in this uh, training material, introduction to bibliometrics uh, and uh, measuring impact. Uh, so for example, if you would uh, do a training uh, for researchers or for other librarians on bibliometrics, you would probably cover what, what is bibliometrics, uh, what are uses and misuses, uh, um, what are author and article level metrics and tools, such as uh, Scopus, Google Scholar, Altmetrics, Web of Science, and uh, how to choose uh, appropriate metrics. Uh, and you see some uh, useful resources already linked here, and uh, I'll show them uh, on the slide. So for example, uh, UCD Dublin has a very good uh, short uh, lib guide introduction to bibliometrics, which is quantitative analysis of publications and uh, it says that it can be used alongside qualitative expert assessment to provide evidence of academic impact and I think that's an important message to take that uh, bibliometrics should always be considered uh, in broader context together with expert assessment and then um, it provides uh, some other information, uh, how to go beyond the bibliometrics, uh, what are responsible metrics, what are sources for tracking citations. Uh, if someone wants to know about journal impact, then uh, there is a specific section, uh, metrics for CV, research profile, uh, how to measure impact of uh, faculties or schools, uh, uh, some resources uh, on university rankings, alt metrics, support and training. So we don't really have time to, to go in details into uh, different uh, types of tools. But if you're interested in tools, uh, then they all here under this link. Uh, and then uh, uh, what kind of impact can be measured with bibliometric data? It's uh, impact of article and books, of particular works or conference proceedings, uh, for example, how many times they are cited by others, then also journal impact, uh, for example, uh, journals are measured by the number of times articles are cited and where they are cited. 
And then for research impact, uh, that could be a number of works that the researcher published, uh, number of times these works have been cited, uh, and um, that could be one of the indicators of academic impact of an individual researcher. Uh, they also have uh, a good section about looking beyond bibliometrics, uh, because, uh, for example, number of citations could be another quantitative metrics uh, could be a useful guide or, or indicator, uh, but uh, they really provide a very limited picture of the impact of research. And uh, they're not the best way to tell about uh, an impact of uh, an individual researcher or faculty or university. So it's really important to combine bibliometrics with quantitative me measures, with uh, expert re review, other types of impact assessment. Uh, and uh, impact uh, is a change. And this change could be uh, cultural, for example, changing of attitudes or opinion, or economic or environmental, health and well being related, policy related, uh, scientific or academic, societal, technological, training and capacity building. And as you can imagine, number of citations or number of articles don't really tell a story of this change. And uh, UCD is really strong in uh, showcasing. Um, impact uh, in this broader sense. Uh, so if, uh, if you're interested, uh, they have this nice um, impact support, research impact planning uh, and support uh, materials. Uh, responsible metrics uh, is a topic that uh, has been highly discussed uh, since uh, 2015, when uh, the metric tide report was uh, released, uh, highlighting uh, some of the biases uh, with uh, bibliometrics and how they could be avoided. And um, also earlier, even earlier than that in 2012, an initi initiative which is called San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment uh, was initiated. Uh, and uh, what this declaration on research assessment says, it stresses again that um, the journal impact factor, as calculated by Thomson Reuters, was originally created as a tool to help librarians identify journals to purchase. So it was never meant to be a measure of scientific quality of research in an article. And uh, with that in my mind, it's critical to understand uh, the limitations of journal impact factor and uh, avoid using uh, journal impact factors in uh, evaluating uh, the quality of an individual article or quality of uh, an individual research. Uh, there is also a good document, uh, Leiden Manifest of Research Metrics, uh, which encourages use broader range of metrics uh, and also you see uh, D has uh, a nice collection of uh, approaches from uh, other universities uh, in Ireland and in the UK uh, on um, taking this critical look at journal impact factors and coming, coming up with better measures. So, uh, there is also a very useful presentation from uh, Michelle Dalton who is scholarly communications librarian at UCD. Uh, which is called Introductions, uh, Introduction to Bibliometrics for Beginners. And um, it's uh, openly available and uh, perhaps you can uh, reuse it if, uh, if you plan uh, similar webinars for your researchers. So then it's not uh, the only example of uh, LibGuide on uh, bibliometrics that I like. There is also University of York, the uh, LibGuide. So it's a little bit shorter. And I think it's, it's also a good place to, to go and check what needs to be covered. Uh, and when we talk about bibliometrics, we talk about article level indicators, also level indicators, journal level indicators, institutional level indicators, alternative metrics and researcher profiles like Richard mentioned earlier. 
So that's San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment uh, that uh, I mentioned earlier. So it's been signed and endorsed by uh, thousands of uh, organizations and uh, individuals, uh, including funders, universities, publishers. Uh, um, and uh, what uh, they, they are doing, uh, they, they are collecting uh, use cases, how institutions could move away from uh, journal impact factors and uh, what other metrics they uh, could be using. And these good practices are now highlighted uh, for funders, professional societies, research institutes. Uh, and as you can see, they are short outlines, but uh, uh, now together with uh, Spark Europe, uh, Dora, prepares uh, a more detailed case studies uh, and I think when those studies are ready uh, we, we could have another webinar with people who contributed those case studies and they could tell more if you're interested uh, but basically uh, uh, some examples uh, highlighted on those slides that uh, uh, you can look uh, at significance and impact of uh, three to five key research achievements. And those research achievements could be broader than just journal articles. They could be preprints, for example, if they are highly uh, cited, or, or it could be even training delivered, or maybe sharing key data sets or software or impact of patents. Or, or some other innovations uh, in addition to research publications. Uh, a funder in Austria, a national funder in, um, in their funding ap application says that uh, they, uh, they want to know up to 10 most important scientific or scholarly research achievements of uh, a researcher or research team uh, applying for funding and uh, they're really asking beyond publications so for example awards conference papers keynote speeches important research projects research data software codes also preprints exhibitions knowledge transfer signed com communication licenses or patents um, uh, some uh, funders like NIH, uh, National Institute of Health uh, in, uh, in the US, uh, they introduce so-called bias cages and they are like uh, extended CVs for researchers with summaries uh, of impact uh, for researchers. Uh, And uh, also an important message that uh, research assessment uh, and evaluation approaches are changing and um, discussions are ongoing in many universities and um, usually universities do this uh, in collaborations with faculty members and there is an inter interesting example from uh, University Medical Center Utrecht where uh, they involve even early career researcher uh, to participate in these policy discussions to make sure that uh, societal impact or research excellence uh, is measured in a way that it doesn't discriminate uh, researchers who are just starting uh, their research career. And then um, San Francisco Declaration on Re Research Assessment, Odora has some other example. Uh, so for example, uh, Health Research Board Island requires uh, a narrative-based CV addressing uh, researchers' contribution to knowledge, training, and career development of other researchers and wider research community and society. So looking at this broader impact. Uh, uh, it's also a bit similar in uh, International Development Research Center in Canada. So they are looking into different dimensions of quality. Uh, Australian National Health and Medical Research Council uh, specifically says that uh, they don't want to hear about journal impact factors uh, anymore. So it's not included. Uh, and um, assessment criteria are broader and clearly explained. And uh, they encourage a broad range of measures. Uh, 
uh, also Swiss National Science Foundation introduced uh, this scientific CVs with outlining uh, important contributions uh, or Dutch Research Council, uh, which asked to break researcher CVs into two section, um, academic profile of research and key outputs. And it's up to researcher to describe those key outputs. Uh, uh, that's an example of St. Andrews University responsible metrics website, and uh, they developed a set of principles uh, for the use of indicators in research assessment and management that works for them, for university, and that's also an interesting uh, thing to stress, that there is alignment in uh, looking at a uh, broad measure of impact, but it's really up to a university or a country to decide what matters and um, identify uh, indicators uh, or quality measures uh, and start implementing them. So there is no need to continue repeating something that was done uh, 50 years ago and uh, isn't really working well. Uh, so for example, for this St. Andrews University, they said that they are looking at their expert review, diversity, uh, they make sure the data is really available, uh, integrity and transparency. Open University in uh, Catalonia in Spain um, added uh, achieving sustainable development goals as uh, one of uh, impact uh, indicators that uh, they are asking researchers to address. So they are more interested in, uh, not, not in the number of citations, but how research is really making a difference. Uh, and uh, uh, during Open Access Week in October, we had a webinar with China. Um, and as you know, China now publishes largest amount of scientific pa papers uh, globally. And um, what they said that they, um, they are not uh, looking into any indexes of journals of papers or, or papers any longer. So they are really looking into the quality of an individual article, and it doesn't matter whether it was published in um, an international journal or in um, Chinese journal. Uh, it's what's important is uh, the content, the quality of this paper. Uh, whether it addresses the issues, whether it solves the issues, or whether it brings innovations, and they're not going to use any any indexes anymore. And I think that that's really a big uh, thing uh, that happened earlier this year. And uh, there are similar discussions in Latin America and in Europe, uh, and I'll, I'll mention Europe a little bit later. So basically, uh, I think it's the right time for universities to reconsider how researchers are assessed and evaluated and come up with a set of standards and indicators that really work well. And uh, those, uh, those new approaches could be uh, narrative CVs. Uh, they could be uh, really prioritizing uh, quality over quantity and uh, looking uh, at a broader picture than uh, just the numbers. Uh, and uh, last week, uh, IATUL, which is uh, a collaboration group of uh, technical uh, universities uh, released uh, a short online course, uh, they call it uh, research impact scenes, and they have 11 research impact scenes, uh, really short uh, text and uh, short videos between two and 10 minutes uh, on different topics. So for example, uh, 
basics of bibliometrics, how to get started, what are the challenges and issues, uh, traditional metrics, uh, measuring citations, uh, emerging metrics, uh, and we'll come to emerging metrics in, in, in a minute. Uh, but for example, here they, they look at data citations, uh, because that, that's, uh, that's, that's a new area. Um, and uh, there are a lot of uh, initiatives going on also to track uh, how data sets are cited and use that as an indicator of impact. Uh, or, or also pattern citation data. And um, there are free tools for that, for example, lens.org, where you can um, see uh, information about patterns from your researchers or your institutions. Um, and then there is also a section about um, responsible use of metrics, uh, which calls for robust metrics. Uh, so really, universities should pick up the metrics that uh, the best possible data in terms of ac accuracy and scope for them. So for example, if there are not so mu much about impact of African research in uh, European databases and European databases shouldn't be used for that. Uh, transparency, diversity, um, using a different indicators for different fields, because that's, that's also not fair to compare number of citations in uh, sciences and social science and humanities, because uh, usually in social science and humanities, especially in humanities, people don't cite so much. So that's not a good way to com compare researchers or benchmark researchers from sciences and humanities, for example. And reflexivity really um, anticipating uh, potential limitations and effects of uh, indicators. Sir. And there is a short video that explains that. Sir. And then some challenges, sir. Uh, for example, how could uh, responsible metrics sir, be applied in, um, in a certain institutions? And there are some examples from uh, other universities, and that's something that you can use to think about uh, your responsible metrics. Um, then uh, uh, bibliometrics uh, can also help in uh, benchmarking research performance of individuals, institutions, departments, centers, faculties, uh, so to compare individuals, institutions, departments, research centers, or universities against uh, each other. And um, uh, most of those benchmarking tools uh, for individuals are subscription-based, uh, but there is uh, uh, a free tool, multi-rank, for comparing universities. Um, and then, of course, rankings, university rankings uh, is addressed uh, in this course. Uh, and. Uh, what are the limitations of current rankings uh, and uh, what how those limitations should be taken account when um, position of a certain university in a ranking uh, is discussed uh, then a topic on how to ensure equity diversity and inclusion and societal impact in research assessment and evaluation so that was a short introduction to bibliometrics. And then the um, second part is about uh, research assessment. And uh, uh, usually when we talk uh, about uh, impact, uh, we frame it around how to make sure that your work is count. And then um, training outline uh, for researchers or for librarians could be uh, how how to recognize and use uh, different types of research uh, impact metrics, how to apply them uh, to various forms of scholarships, uh, which tools uh, are available for gathering research impact, uh, how to use uh, qualitative evidence, uh, uh, 
to make researchers aware of uh, appropriate uses and limitations of citation metrics and old metrics uh, and how to develop a strategy of gathering researcher impact or school's impact or faculty impact or university's impact uh, and how library could support that uh, and uh, as with bibliometrics, uh, there are also links to uh, webinars, uh, lib guides, uh, presentations that you can reuse for that. Uh, and um, last year, we had a webinar with uh, Michelle Dalton from uh, UCD um, uh, on library services support measuring research impact uh, and uh, recording and slides are available and I'll, I'll show just a couple of them relevant for today's discussion but uh, if you're interested please go back and uh, have a look at slides and recordings uh, so these are typical questions that uh, she receives uh, in her university as scholarly communications manager. So researcher would come and ask, uh, how can I increase my research impact? How can I demonstrate uh, research impact for funding application or for promotion? How can I track citations? Uh, and then of course, that uh, what we already discussed that uh, citations don't represent my impact very well. What else can I do? And then uh, her advice is really to start with uh, impact goals, because those impact goals could be different for different researchers from different disciplines. So re researchers should think what type of impact uh, she's trying to achieve, who will benefit from this research and how, then how can you measure that and how can you capture and provide evidence And then uh, traditional bibliometrics could be used to track author and article impact. So for example, uh, Scopus could be used for citations or Web of Science or Google Scholar uh, or Cywal to benchmark performance. Uh, but uh, it's, it's really important to remember that uh, these bibliometrics citations should be used uh, alongside other indicators uh, and should be part of the narrative that provides a fully picture. Alternative metrics could be uh, metrics around uh, usage and conversations of research outputs uh, and uh, examples could be uh, social media pages, like number of uh, discussions uh, for a particular paper on social media, Facebook, Twitter, for example, uh, Google Analytics for web content. Um, and um, this alternative metrics, this additional metrics could provide uh, a little bit broader context uh, about reach and impact, uh, and they could be part of qualitative information. But of course, uh, we should realize that uh, discussions will be, especially social media discussions, will be going around really high impact articles. Uh, and uh, we, we can't expect broad engagement of everyone in uh, every especially specific research topics. So other alternative metrics could be number of downloads of paper. For example, if you have papers in the repository, you can track number of downloads and use that as additional metrics. Reviews, mentions in policy documents, media mentions, social media mentions we already discussed, uh, how research materials are included in uh, educational materials or training materials or exhibitions, events, uh, other communications materials uh, and other types of wider public engagement. Uh, and this is, for example, the repository at UCD. And this is how they uh, show uh, number of downloads. You, they use the space crease. So they have this uh, link to Google Scholar check and uh, they display page views and downloads. But even if you don't have the space crease, you, you can still uh, uh, make available uh, usage statistics, which is built in, uh, in this space and also use Matomo and Google Analytics to, 
track set. So that's altmetric pages that I mentioned earlier. So for example, this article in Nature was highly po popular. It was picked up by news outlets, blogged, referenced in policy documents, in one patent, uh, discussed on social media. But of course, we, we should understand that uh, um, most media here, uh, international media or British media, so it's very unlikely that, that they will really pick up uh, a research story from uh, Ukraine, which is my country, or from Ghana. So we should also understand uh, certain limitations of our geographies. Um, and then um, uh, journal metrics. Uh, so they really uh, useful to or could be used to compare journals, but they're not useful at all to compare researchers or individual articles. So advises never use journal metrics to evaluate an individual researcher or an individual article because uh, that's true. There are many articles published in high impact journals which never receive a single citation. And uh, it's really important not to use journal rankings or metrics to demonstrate an impact of researchers. A responsible metrics we already discussed, San Francisco Declaration Research Assessment, uh, metrics should be used in broader context, uh, diverse types of metrics, selection of metrics to provide a fuller balanced picture in a context. Uh, and if metrics are used, then uh, limitation of those metrics should be stressed. What they cover and what they don't cover. And uh, these are some, some of the examples that UCD Library is doing in this area. So they set up a service for researchers uh, and uh, uh, they help with funding applications. Uh, and what really worked well for them, they identified uh, a champion. So it could be one researcher or it could be a school where library will work uh, with that school to try to tell this broad story of impact. And then using that pilot collaboration, you can explore successes and challenges. And then you can consider whether the service could be really rolled out as sustainable and scalable service of the library, because maybe it would take too much effort or too much time. And then, of course, for the libraries, sir, the sustainability and scalability is one question, but also you could think about different levels of services. So, for example, you could have educational and training events where you just inform researchers. And um, I showed you some of the materials uh, which are available already that you can reuse. So that's, that's something that you can do easier. But if you want to start one-to-one -one advice or consultation, then you should be aware that uh, at some point you might receive so, so many requests that it might be not manageable. And then um, libraries also offer detailed and in-depth support for complex projects, but that's again time consuming and uh, you should decide whether that's something you want to open or you want to offer in your library. But I think at least education and training events uh, should be offered, but I think that's already the case for, for many of your libraries. Uh, then these were some of the key success factors for UCD. Uh, finding the right tools to measure impact, uh, collaborations, uh, and flexibility, because like I said, a lot is changing. And then some of the key skills that librarians need to have, uh, those li librarians who would like to offer this kind of advice. Uh, so it's uh, some kind of statistics skills, of course, communication and relationship skills, uh, ability to explain complex com concepts clearly, because that's, that's really a com complex concept. Uh, and then uh, training experience and uh, willingness to keep up to date. Because uh, even uh, last time I talked about this topic, couple of weeks ago and uh, even between 
two weeks and now there were some new resources released so it's really um, important to keep track and then uh, these are some of the challenges that um, your advice could help uh, some researchers in some disciplines but not necessary in all the disciplines because of disciplinary differences uh, and then of course uh, availability of open or freely available tools uh, isn't great so if you don't have uh, commercial tools for that you, it's, it's a bit hard to offer as a service but even if you have commercial tools then uh, unfortunately quality of data in those tools is uh, is really poor and um, it also has certain limitations um, and I'd like to end up with uh, the discussions that are going on uh, in the European University Association now. Uh, they had a uh, survey on um, research assessment in the tradition to open science, and they asked uh, uh, universities which types of academic work matter most for research career. And as you can see now, it's all about research publications, but then there were also other types of academic work that universities track. And you see highlighted here, open science and open access, because uh, open science and open access practices uh, are also count uh, in uh, research assessment and evaluation processes. Uh, uh, there was another, report about uh, European funders, how they uh, look into open policies and practices uh, for evaluation and uh, what, what they measure. And you see that, that uh, they said that they measure research uptake and dissemination strategies, or quality of those strategies, or in addition to obvious number of peer reviewed articles or prizes, uh, they also look at quality of plans for societal impact, uh, quality of project management governments, uh, governance, in addition to citations. Uh, so they are already using different uh, indicators. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, not many funders have strong uh, policies, uh, open science and open access policies linked with research assessment and evaluation. So there is still a little bit of separation what funders uh, with open access policies expect researchers to do and how they evaluate those researchers, but that's changing. Uh, and uh, I already mentioned all these reports. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll mention one more Hong Kong principles for research assessment is also a good document. Um, and um, uh, a working group in the European Commission su suggested uh, metrics for evaluating research career, fully acknowledging open science practices, and they listed uh, different types of open science uh, activities and how they could be uh, evaluated. Um, and uh, uh, this report is now being used by uh, a number of universities to adjust their approaches to research assessment and evaluation. Uh, and there is also a discussion about creating a registry of uh, open uh, um, evaluation and assessment policies, uh, registry of rewards and incentives uh, on open science. And uh, my last slides were taken from a discussion uh, on that, but it's, it's still uh, in the making. And also in UNESCO recommendations in open science, open evaluation was mentioned as um, one of the areas worth exploring and also introducing, uh, uh, and aligning incentives for open science in research assessment and evaluation. So that was as short as, as I could take for, for this really complex topic. <laughs> Thank you very much, Irina. That was very, indeed, it's very, very complex anyway. Bibliometric issues and all those metrics. It's very, very, a very complex thing. Thank you very much. So uh, in case you have any question, you can put it on the Q&A and then we can 
uh, move on. But uh, there's also a few questions that I want to ask her. So how can you increase paper citation? How can you increase your citation? Let's say avoiding um, self-citation, but how do you increase it? And then the, another one is, how can papers that are good in quality of content receives low citation? Well, I'll start with, with your second question. Um, it really depends on the discipline because there, there are certain research disciplines where citations are common and certain research disciplines where um, it's not common to, to cite uh, the work of others. Um, uh, so it's uh, unfortunately it's quite often that uh, excellent papers uh, don't receive citations. Another problem with citations is that uh, they are just numbers, and uh, they are not really addressing in which context this work was cited, because uh, anecdotally. Uh, in my country, there are some researchers who, who say, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's encourage people to critique us. So let, let, let people mention us, like our research in negative context. It would still be counted as a citation and it would still help us with this number. But that's, that's ridiculous because uh, people are citing not because this other work is, is good, but they, they are mentioning it as, as a bad example. But this nuances, are, whether it's a good or bad example, are not really um, captured in uh, the citation number. For increasing citation strategies, uh, uh, I think it would be useful to track our number of citations that uh, an article uh, has in uh, certain journals for the past three years, for example, and then uh, compare that with uh, number of citations of similar articles in, in the journal to try to understand whether, whether it's an issue of uh, this research article or whether was it just uh, discipline specific issues that are also other articles in these journals are not cited or maybe um, it's an issue with a journal and, and uh, uh, maybe it makes sense to try to look for another journal where uh, there will be possibility of more, more citations, but also citations take time. And um, I mentioned three year window, but maybe even three year window isn't long enough uh, for, for certain areas. And in other areas, things change so quickly that uh, by the time this article is published, there is already a newer article uh, that uh, could be cited. So, so there are strategies, uh, but uh, I don't think researchers should be really fixed on uh, this number. Great, Irina, thanks. Uh, would, you, would you say it's fair for lecturers or faculty members to introduce their students to their papers for them to cite just to increase citation. Is it fair? No, it's not fair. <laughs> it's, it's corruption. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are well, some, the, 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 like in Russia, for example, some researchers saying, uh, let's, let's agree, I'll be citing you and you'll be citing me. And then that would increase citation. But that's also, that's, that's not honest. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, you, you should be citing because this work is good, not because uh, you, you just want to gain this number. It's, it's basically, all these metrics are about gaming, that all, all of them could be gamed. And um, that's why they shouldn't be a single indicator. Right, Irina, there's another question here. You say, who can enroll for, for the IATU online course? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Theodosia. I put a link in a chat to this course and it's, uh, it's a self-learning course. So you, you, you just go and click on uh, the pages you are interested. Um, so it's, uh, it's mainly for librarians, I would say, uh, but also for researchers who would like to know more 
about these topics, sir. Great, producer. So your question is answered. Uh, David, your question is which of the metrics should an upcoming researcher focus more on? Mm -hmm. This is coming from David. I think if really for early career researchers, it would be good to, to go through that exercise that I showed. Uh, what kind of impact? What, what is a goal of this researcher? Is this uh, to receive more citations? Then uh, together with uh, PI, uh, they should look for a journal that would be good for that. Or maybe the goal is to showcase that uh, this research has uh, wide and broad impact, and then maybe put in uh, a paper in the repository would help to collect uh, data about uh, number of downloads, number of uses from all over the world. And, and maybe uh, that's, that's a stronger story than uh, three citations this article will receive. Because if this article is used and downloaded thousand times from all over the world, maybe it does tell something. Of course, it's, it's also important to share about research on social media, professional, professional social media like Twitter, and uh, track discussions. Uh, and for that, I mentioned uh, altmetrics pages, which uh, could be freely added to repositories, for example. Then every article with a DOI will have that altmetric page. So then maybe if an early career researcher sees that um, a story, a, a research was picked up by uh, for example, medical community in India, and uh, uh, there is a blog post about that. That that's also a demonstration of impact. Um, so, if you have some early career researchers uh, who who are interested in this, maybe uh, like I said, I'll be happy to specifically work with uh, some of you with your researchers to brainstorm. Uh, how we could find better tools to measure and showcase the impact. Great, thank you, Rina. I just want to let you know that this webinar is organized in collaboration with the, I mean, with, is organized by CALIC. CALIC is a consortium of academic and research libraries in Ghana, and it's done in collaboration with IFL. IFL is Electronic Information for Libraries. And I just want to let you know that the director, Rima, is, on, is, is here with us. She's also listening. Rima, thank you very much for giving us your platform and releasing the arena for this presentation. Thank you very much. Um, the question is still coming. Please put it, bring in your questions. Uh, I invited some few people, they are here. Please, Edna and Professor Atina Bey, Professor in KNRST here. Yesterday we were discussing some of these things and very happy that we got some more knowledge about it. Uh, there's a question here, um, still on citation. The, David is still asking, he just want to find out, what if a lecturer refers a student to his paper in terms of fairness of a citation, increasing citation? Is it a bad thing? Because you know, the issue is that there are people, there are lecturers who are lecturing or supervisors who are supervising students, PhD students and all, and they never refer their works to students. And meanwhile, they are experts within the area of the person, of the student, the, of the student topic. Here is the case, they never refer to, their, they refer their works to them. And so David is also asking, is it fair to also, I mean, refer a student to uh, his papers or her papers? Yes, of course, if, uh, if they're relevant to the course, if they're relevant uh, to the subject, to the topic uh, of the teaching. Um, but this lecture shouldn't say, uh, please cite my papers. Citation is a decision that is taken by another researcher and no one should be influenced. It, um... Okay. All right. All right. Okay. So not necessarily increasing the citation. That's fine. Okay. 
So there's another question from Teodio. So he said, what is the use of the other impacts when they are not going to be considered for anything in the institution? That's exactly the point that I'm making, that uh, that's what many institutions already started doing uh, globally, uh, that uh, they are looking in, in the broad range of metrics. And I think there's a discussion that should also happen uh, in, uh, in your universities, uh, in your institutions. Uh, because as you see, those metrics are, are collected, provided by uh, tools and companies uh, hosted in the global north. And they're not even working for the global north and institutions in the global north are saying uh, we we're moving away from them. We we don't we don't need to keep using them if they're not working. So this kind of reflection already happened in the global north. It's going on in um, China, I mentioned it, but also happened in China, Latin America. And I think that that's also something that should happen in Africa because uh, those metrics never worked well for African researchers. And uh, it's really high time for universities to stop this fix fixation on citations and uh, journal impact factors and um, identify what kind of impact they want to make as universities. and. Uh, select uh, metrics and I showed that there are, there are already tons of different other impact uh, measures and metrics. I think someone counted like 493 if you want to. Uh, so there are different possibilities and it's, it's really up to institutions uh, to decide how what matters for them and how they promote researchers. Of course, uh, alignment is needed uh, across countries. Um, Well, li librarians are not uh, are not in, in the position to bring change, but they are in position to highlight limitations of current metrics because, uh, again, unfortunately, in uh, in many cases, uh, researchers themselves are not aware of those limitations. So librarians are the ones who could say uh, what is not working well and uh, what uh, could work better. Like even, uh, I, I don't see any harm if uh, KNUST will start uh, looking at uh, whether research contributes to sustainable development goals because sustainable development goals are very high on African agenda. And um, there are tools for that. Uh, so it's just uh, an opportunity to bring new perspective uh, and um, like I said, you, you, you don't need to change everything. You can start with like, for example, if there is an early career researcher who wants to make sure that his or her research makes a real impact or, and then maybe it could be just a small exercise with this researcher, of course, in the context of your university, but also in a, in a broader context or, and then that uh, or with, with one school or faculty and then that exercise could be shared with with an institution, because I, I'm afraid if uh, if nothing changes, then um, there will be all those new new changes that I mentioned uh, in Europe or in North America, and um, we will get stuck with with the tools which don't really work well for us. Right. Is there any more question? Um, so Teodosia says thank you, I think, for the clarification. And thanks for your questions, Teodosia. Mm. The, let's just you know, let you know that um, the recordings will be sent to you after the webinar. So stay put. Uh, any more questions? We are still looking for questions. If there's no any questions, just let you know that this is our last webinar, Calic, I feel Calic which webinar. For the year this is the last one for the year we are hoping to continue next year so what we'll do is that for those of you who have been joining some of these webinars we'll be sending you links just to let us know the training needs so that we can continue with some of these things and because i believe that 
with this short, uh, the, this COVID time, we've learned quite a lot. And I think we need to continue with some of these things. Still waiting for questions. Um, so Irina, uh, for, for, for my university, what we do now is that, you know, populating repositories is a very big challenge. So what we have done is we've tied promotion assessment and promotion document to pop, uh, putting your papers in the repository. The next thing is that we've also encouraged every staff who is applying for promotion to set up his ORCID uh, platform, ORCID ID, get an ORCID ID. Then another one is that we make sure that everybody applying for promotion or anybody applying for promotion is able to, it goes to Google Scholar and set up his Google Scholar profile. Uh, with some few rankings that have come out, KNUST has been ranked highly. Uh, I don't know whether you, what, what, what do you say about some of these things? Because- uh, Well, um, I, I, I think they contributed to higher positions in rankings sir, because you're following all current good practices um, and you're not asking for anything extra you, you're asking for things which already accepted practices like uh, orchid ids or which are part of your university's policy to set up a repository so i think they they contributed to your impact and i think that's that's the minimum uh, other universities could also do because we realize that if we, if, you know, people don't do what you'll inspect, uh, what you'll expect, but they only do what you inspect. So we have tied this to promotion. So every, anybody who is applying for promotion, make sure that you have some of these things. So, I mean, there's a very good strategy that KNUST, Farming Common Invest of Science and Technology Ghana, we've adopted. And I think some universities can also do the same thing. Because uh, the ORCID ID, setting up your ORCID ID, you will need your institution email address. When you are also setting up your Google Scholar profile, you also need your institution email address. So everything that any ranking bodies all over, when they are doing ranking, they also go online and then look for papers and on, on citations and all those things just for uh, to be added to a particular institution or an author for the author or for the institution to be ranked. So that is what we are doing in KDW. So it looks like there are no more questions coming up. I think till. Philius has his hand raised. Okay. All right. Maybe Irina, can you open here for mm -hmm. right, if you want to? Um, I promoted you to a panelist. Okay. So I think you, you, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, you can unmute yourself and talk, please. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hello. Okay. So, um, a warm morning to all of us. Um, with regard to the institutional repository, um, University of Cape, Cape Coast have partnered Drake. Drake is the um, research arm of the institution. What we realized that we've had issues asking faculty members to bring their um, research work or publications to the, to, to, for us to put into the repository. It's not forthcoming. Um, so what we did is that Drake had a platform called UCC, Google, UCC Scholar, where they were able to harvest over 9,600 publications from research work. And what it means is that this UCC Scholar tells um, what is being ha what is happening here in terms of research? Okay, it tells you who has highest H index, who has the highest I10 index. I mean, who is who is who is, who is whose work is more cited? So what we did is that we partnered them, and we went into the uh, into the Google into the um, UCC Scholar to download all these articles, almost ten thousand articles, and we are now populating it into the institutional repository. And the idea is that we want them to, we want, we want, we want, we want to increase visibility and readership of these publications because they've written and no one is, you know, people are not really getting much use of it. So this is one area we are also doing. And I think it's really gaining, gaining currency within the institution. People are now really hitting the institutional repository. So this is one thing that we also done. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Theo, Theophilos Okran. Thank you very much. But you also have to be very careful of the copyright issues and copyright infringement so that you don't put papers that are that's authors have signed away our copyright into the repository. So maybe as you are going on, you have to be careful of some of these things. Thank you. Yeah. Irina, okay. You, okay. Thank you. Irina, it looks like there are no more questions. So Theodos here had her hand up. Okay. So I added right. her. As a I, panelist. Think, I think Richard has said what I was going to say. The copyright issues. I mean it's easy to just harvest all those articles, but I think they have to be very much aware of the copyright issues. He said what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. so that's Thanks. And also Edward uh, yeah. wrote, wrote in the chat. Uh, so I think that that's already addressed. Uh, and there is a question, how far the self-citation society in all lab research works uh, are helpful, whether such citations are useful or we should avoid such citations. Um, it really depends on, uh, on the journal policy uh, and guidelines. Uh, so I don't see any harm in uh, citing uh, your lab research works uh, uh, in terms of self citations. Uh, you should really be careful if if you use a self citation to avoid writing again about something you already you already wrote. Then of course that's that's justified because you you are building on your works. But uh, it would look a little bit weird if all your all citations in your article would be uh, self citations, um, and that's another like that, that's another nuance that uh, isn't counted when uh, citations are tracked. Uh, in which content, in, in which context, those citations are used to support your argument or save space uh, in an article, uh, because. That's already been explained somewhere else. So. Right. I think we have really, really enjoyed this presentation. As I said, this is the last one for the year. So we are hoping to continue next year. Uh, someone is, as I said, in my institution, an a lecturer going for promotion must send their publication to the library for plagiarism checks. And that's how we have been able to get articles for submission to the IR. But if these lecturers are not aware of ORCID ID, how can we encourage these faculty members to go for the ORCID ID? So it's like Richard said, the, the best encouragement is an institutional policy. If, uh, if you have an institution-wide recommendation or, or even requirements that all researchers should uh, register an ORCID ID, that that would help because uh, it's it's free. It only takes a uh, couple of minutes to register. Of course, our researchers have have to keep it up to date, um, and that will take time. But uh, it's really useful. So I would say institutional policies uh, will help with that. And then uh, also that's a role for for the library to provide training uh, on how to register for an ORCID ID, how to use ORCID ID, and um, in that Eiffel uh, training framework uh, that I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we also have a section uh, with um, reusable training materials on ORCID. Right, Colette, it looks like your, your question has been answered. But your, uh, maybe I, I would have, if I have to ask that question, it will raise more uh, discussion. But I was wondering how come some, someone has published his paper already and then the library is doing plagiarism check? And <laughs> I don't know how this is done. <laughs> anyway. Because the paper has already been published. I don't know why that they should bring it to the library for them to do plagiarism check. But I know you, so maybe we'll, we'll do the discussion after this presentation, after this webinar. Uh, Irina, please, are you seeing any more questions? Or there, there's nothing to add? No, I don't. I don't see any more questions, sir. Thanks a lot, sir, for for your questions, and I'm I'm glad, sir, we we're, we're having these discussions, and uh, I really hope we can continue next year, and um, we can bring some changes to research assessment and evaluation because um, it's really high time to do that. Great. 
So at uh, this time, I just want to say a very big thank you to, uh, to you, Irina, for all your time. Where you are, you don't, you are not in that capacity to do it, you bring in other people. So we are hoping next year to will happen the same. So we also say a big thank you to Kalik, the chair, which is Dr. Kobler of UCC Library, the University Library for UCC, um, and the, all the executives of Kalik for pushing for this training to come up. And again, I also want to say a thank, thank you to Rima, who is still on, online with us. Uh, so hopefully we will be rolling out more next year. And I want to thank all of you, our friends from India, from Nigeria. Nigerians have been joining our webinar these days. So still broke you in any time there's anything coming up. So we'll say thank you very much. I want to say enjoy your day, the rest of the day, wherever you are. God bless you. So we'll meet again. Irina, thank you very much. So we'll end the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.